So Aaron, good morning. It's the first morning of Ruby Kaigi 2023. We're here in Matsumoto. Uh, so what you been up to last couple of days? Uh, hey, Justin. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh, yesterday, so yesterday was interesting. I guess yesterday was day zero of Ruby Kaigi. That's right. Right? Yeah. Today's day one. Yesterday was day zero. Actually, uh, Asakusa RB happened in Tokyo two days ago. So I was talking to some people and they said that yesterday was actually day zero. Two days ago was day negative one. Negative one. <laughs> and now today is day one. Day one. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I guess yesterday I was I was here early for the conference because we had like, a, uh, well, two things really. We had a Ruby core team meeting, um, just a developers meeting about, I think there were nearly 30 of us wow. at the meeting. Um, and how, then, how many of those folks are, are, are Japanese versus came from abroad? Good question. I'd say like maybe, I think there are maybe 10, 10 people from, 10 foreign wow. foreign people. I think 20, 20 folks from here in Japan, probably another 10 from just around. And yeah, yeah. What's, so most of us, I've never been to a Ruby Core meeting. You yeah. Know? I know most of them happen over Zoom Yeah. Uh, throughout the year. When you finally all get into person, what kind of stuff do you talk about and prioritize? Uh, well, this time, I guess, like, since we're doing the meeting in person this time, we were trying to do, like, I, I don't know, more complex, like, harder stuff. Mm. Probably the two, the biggest topic was the two competing Ruby parsers was, like, the main, that was, like, the most contentious thing. The rest of the, the rest of it was just, like, I don't know. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, none of the tickets are really boring, just, like, you know, not hot topics, I guess. Okay, so uh, I'm familiar with the parsing drama. Okay. Uh, uh, and of course, you're intimately close to it, but like for anyone who doesn't know, right? Ruby, as opposed to being a compiled language, your code runs, you know, first is loaded up, the files are loaded, and then it has to be parsed each time you run the program. Yeah. And so it's really important for Ruby to have a very fast parser because yeah. it's a limiter on your, your, your load Input. time. Input, yeah, yeah. Right? And so what's the current there's a current parser and now there's two competing alternate parsers that yeah i guess it's, it's not i basically we've got we got two parsers the team the team that i'm working on or the the parser i'm working on at work is one called yarp or i'm working with a team like, i'm just helping out really my when yeah, i say you're doing very on little. It, yes i'm doing very little <laughs> you mean you're in a slack channel and yes. you help sometimes yes with exactly Ruby problems yes got it <laughs> but the one we're working on is called yarp and it's a, a handwritten like a handwritten recursive descent recursive descent parser the other one is um uh written by kaneko uh mm. and it's it's basically just an improvement on the existing on the existing parser so what is it and is the existing one bison based yeah, the existing one is Bison based, and what he's trying to do is like um, it, it's kind of interesting because both teams, our team, his team, they ha we have the same goals, which are uh, making the parser more maintainable, making it more extendable, and also making it easier to use by third parties. So, for mm. example, like being able to share the parser with JRuby or Truffle Ruby, uh, for example. But the approaches that we're taking are different. We're taking are different. We're writing a brand new parser, whereas uh, Kaneko-san is like taking the old parser and trying to extract it from mm -hmm. the existing implementation and make it so that other people can use it. Yeah, and so you called it YARP, which yep. I imagine stands for yet, yet another, another Ruby, Ruby parser. parser. Yes, just like YARV, yet another Ruby VM, yes. or YAML, <laughs> yet another markup language. Yep. Is this? Are there only three? Uh, yeah. Yet another's. I don't know. I've, I feel like you could go very deep with that. You could be like yet another, yet another. That yeah, would yeah. be a yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised neither of us have ever tried making a, a, a yaw thing. Yeah. A, a yaw related gem. Like, I mean, you did your garbage compactor, but yag, yagka doesn't yagka, sound. Yagka, no. Doesn't ha roll off the tongue. No. Uh, so, so you also mentioned you went to Keyboard Kaigi. I did, yeah. And this is a first annual Keyboard Kaigi, which I talked to one of the organizers last night at the after, I only went, went to the after party because I'm not a, a keyboard nerd uh, <laughs> like this guy. But I talked to one of the organizers and she was telling me that the reason that they started a standalone Day Zero conference was there's so many keyboard fans in the Ruby community here that they'd all bring their keyboards and just hack up anyway. Yes. It was actually like 
creating a distraction <laughs> yes. from the conference. I, I remember previous years, like I would always bring my keyboard and previous years everybody would just bring their keyboards and take them out and we'd all be like, oh wow, these are so cool. <laughs> Soldering in the middle of the conference hall. Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess they're basically like the Ruby Kaigi organizers are like, take your, take your garbage somewhere else. <laughs> Get, Not get on this, our dime. Yeah, get those keyboards out of here. <laughs> they had really cool merch. They had sweatshirts. They had multiple T-shirts. They mm -hmm. had uh, uh, little like uh, uh, brass pins and yeah. stuff. Like it was a legit operation. Speaking of legit operation, we're here at Kaigi, and there's like 35 booths behind us. That's what you're looking at. It's like tons of sponsors. They've got over 1,200 guests. Yeah. And so this is a big deal. This is bigger than RubyConf in America. Bigger than RailsConf in America. Uh, this year, uh, so it's really impressive how much. Because like, you know, you started coming to these a long time ago. I think yeah. my first uh, overseas Kaigi was 2014 or 2015. Mm -hmm. Like, that, this is double, triple that size. I want to yeah, say. Yeah, it's huge. It's. I love to see that Ruby has become more popular in Japan and more inclusive as well. So there's like way more, you know, women speakers now, mm -hmm. and just like a. Uh, younger people coming in, yes. like a new generation of developers actually contributing to Ruby Core. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if there's anything on the schedule today here on day one that you're looking forward to seeing. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, this the schedule. I guess like since the this conference is a multi-track, like it's a multi-track conference. So of course that comes with the problem of like, what do you see? Because there's like I can't I can't be in two places at once. That yeah. Problem. Uh, today I'm looking forward to. There's a couple really good talks I want to see. Uh, Koichi is going to talk about uh, Raptors, and I really want to see that one. But it's also happening at the same time as uh, uh, I want to see Mari San's talk. She's going to talk about um, encoding, like yeah, encoding stuff. Because like, I think MRuby previously could only do ASCII, mm -hmm. and now she, and she'd implemented a way to hack in UTF-8 UTF yeah. in, into into MRuby. Yeah, I'm excited to see that because I like I saw her I saw her talk at Ruby Kaigi last year. Online, I watched it online last year, and she also talked about uh, like uh, oh moji bake. <laughs> what what I don't know what moji bake is. Like when you mess up or when encoding gets messed up on the Oh. Code. So like it just creates garbage on yeah, the screen. Yeah, you just see garbage on the yeah. garbage on the screen. So she was talking about that and it was it was really funny and a good like really good presentation. So I wanna see both I wanna see both of those. I'm not sure which I, one I think I only do. met her for the first time last night, mm -hmm. but she seems hilarious. She seems yeah. like a really thoughtful, smart individual. And if you're listening to, to, to Aaron and I talk about encodings and UTF versus ASCII and like the history of encoding, text encoding in Japan for mm -hmm. among computer users has been really fraught. Can you explain like a little bit to somebody who maybe isn't familiar with Japanese language why encoding is such a big deal here? Yeah, I mean because I don't use US ASCII. <laughs> <laughs> so I they mean, write these special characters called kanji that are like yes. very complicated and take more than one byte to store. Yeah, that, so, so that was like, I guess that's like the origin of the problem is that we only had eight byte, we only had eight byte characters. So then it's like, well, how do you, we have more characters than that. Like, what yes. do you do? What do you do about that? So then they came up with a bunch of different encode, different competing encodings. So like, there's I remember old, shift JIS was the big one when I was yeah. studying here in 2005. I don't remember what the other ones are. Shift gist is the only like that's the only one I've ever messed with. And they um I guess like a bunch of old systems, specifically I think like government systems mm -hmm. may still use it. Mm -hmm. Um so But when anyway. UTF came out, I mean from an American's perspective, that was like an unalloyed good thing. But in Japan, especially in the programming community, my understanding is it was like rather contentious. Yeah, I think it was it was it was contentious because of Han, what was it? I forgot. The Han, uni, ah, Han, no, the, unifica Han yes. unification was the problem. It's often in the, in the West referred to as CJK unification because they took all of the characters from Korean, Chinese, and Japanese, hence CJK, and, and tried to put create them code points yeah. for all of them with different glyphs for the localized language which required you to kind of munch together these languages that had been diverging for 2,000 years. I guess part of the problem, or part of the problem which I guess it's a, from what I understand, a fairly rare problem is that there are some, mm -hmm. there are some, so like Japanese uses Chinese characters, but some of the, like, some of those characters went away during the mm -hmm. Han unification. Oh, okay. And 
they're not the the thing is that these characters are not commonly like they're not used in probably Japanese. Probably just probably just used for surnames maybe. Yes, they're used for names. Place location names. Yeah. Yeah. So then it's like but it's it's super rare, it's super rare so I think like most <laughs> There's some guy out there who like I I can't type my name naming, anymore. Yeah. But the, you can type so the issue is you can type it it's just that the the character when you read it it's like it's not exactly what it oh, what it's supposed to be. Maybe it's a little bit different. So the, these are the kinds of you know, Western privilege uh, points that we don't think about very often, but it's, uh, encodings are a big deal here. Uh, you know, oh, before I let you go, you would mentioned you want, were looking forward to the Ractor talk. Yeah. Now, Ractor, R-A-C-T-O-R, I'm spelling it for you because even though it's a few years old, it hasn't gotten a lot of use. And I believe that's what Koichi's, I'm going to be going to that, uh, to that one. What his talk today is about is sort of reflections on why hasn't Ractor gotten more adoption, how he could improve in the future. Uh, so for my own sake, so I understand his talk, what the hell is Ractor? <laughs> so Ractors are like, um, I guess you can think about them as, you can think about them like threads, mm. uh, except that they're running their own, they're running their own Ruby VM inside of them. And it means that you can run, so like normally on, in normal Ruby code, you can have threads, you can do like thread.new, but as we, you know, we all know, it's, it's super we, easy to keep all those organized and <laughs> yes, easy to program with threads. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, but Ruby. So Ruby is famous for not being able to do things in parallel, and that's true. Even if you do like multiple threads, you can't do like it can't do it, any CPU stuff in the parallel. The first few kaigis that I came to, I heard a lot of Japanese people talking about Giru, the Gil. Uh, 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 Gil is G I L stands for Global Interpreter Lock, and that's because there's like around a lot of resource sharing stuff in the interpreter. Concurrency can't happen. Like there yeah. will be one person holding that lock at a time, no matter yes. how many threads you have in the process. It's so that like if you don't have any, if you share a hash, for example, between two threads, like you can update the hash and it won't crash the process. Mm. But in in between those two threads, so that's what the that's what the lock is for. But this um, Ractor system is true parallelism. So you mm. can do CPU CPU parallelism between different reactors, but without it, having to fork processes or no, anything like no, that. No, no, no. The so the issue is that um, that means like you can't share you can't share like hashes between them or you can't mutate hashes between them. Right. Otherwise you get an exception or whatever. And Rubius being really lazy, you know just, I just want to be able to create like a, an Ivar or even a class uh, variable. Yep. and just like edit it with reckless abandon. And maybe if I feel like I want to really button it up, I'll, I'll pull in concurrent Ruby and just change like, you know, a hash literal to a, you know, concurrent Ruby. Concurrent Ruby, do, yeah, yeah, concurrent Ruby hash, yeah. So, so this is a little bit more buttoned up. Like you probably have to like pass in data a little bit more. Yeah, you got to pass in data or copy it. I think the, I'm, I'm curious to see, to see uh, Koichi's talk because like probably the biggest reason we can't use reactors with Rails is because... Um, you can't share, or one of the big reasons is you can't share um, class instance variables. Mm -hmm. So any, if you try to access class instance variables between reactors, you get an exception. So that's better than un unspecified behavior. <laughs> yes, it, you get an exception. It won't, and it won't crash. You just yeah. get an error. So it's like don't, you know, it's like don't do that. And unfortunately, we do a lot of that. Like we do a lot of that stuff in Rails. So yeah. it's like. Well, um, I look forward to seeing what his reaction to Rector's, you know, lack of adoption is, and like what can be done to make it a little bit more user friendly. Yeah, uh, I would so. love. I I would love it. I would really, really love it if we did more, like, had more code that was Rector friendly, so that we could do we could do all that stuff in parallel. Like, right. I I want, I want it to be a mainstream thing. Yeah, because you you want the computer to go faster. Seems yes. to be like a theme of your career, <laughs> and this would help with yeah, that. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. More cores. <laughs> More problems. Mm. Well, anyway, Aaron, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I, I know we've got a few long days ahead of us practicing Japanese all day, every day. So, yes. ganbatte kudasai. Ganbarimasu. And, and then we've got four after parties to go. Oh, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we've got our work cut out for us. But thanks a lot for, for joining us today. And, uh, yeah, I'll see you around. Bye.